We'll try that again with a mic on. Good morning. There we go. As uh, Brother Chris said, we will be continuing this morning in our series in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 8. And we'll just be looking at two verses this morning. I won't have much of an excuse for going much beyond 12 o'clock if I only have two verses to speak on this morning. Okay. Yes, we will be looking at Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. Before we have a look at that, I want to ask you a question. If you could pick someone, anyone, that could be on your side, could be a helper, an advisor, somebody that might help you physically if you had a physical task to do, somebody that might advise you uh, if you had problems that you had to deal with at work or in your home, or if you had a project at work that was a big challenge that you could pick one of the people that you work with to be on the project with you, who would you, who would you pick? Think about that for a minute. You know, when I was a boy, there was somebody that I liked to have on my side when we would play road hockey, or we would play hockey in the uh, perhaps a rink that my dad would make in the backyard, or they used to, to make one over in the park, the municipal park that was just around the corner from where I grew up. I just had one brother. I still have one brother. There's only two children in my family, and my brother's seven years older than me, and he's a lot more athletic than I am, or at least he, he used to be before he ruined his body playing various sports. <laughs> he turns 55 this year. And I better be careful because he might listen to this message on the internet, so I better, better not say too many things about him. But he was a bit of an idol to me or, or uh, somebody that I looked up to when I was a boy. And uh, he, was a, he was a good athlete, and it seemed like every sport that he played, he did well at it. And he did better at it than me, partially because he was older than me, but I learned even as I got older that part of it was that was just the way that my brother Brian was wired and made, was that he was athletic. And when the kids in the neighborhood, the boys in the neighborhood would get together to play uh, road hockey, and we lived on a street that wasn't that busy, so sometimes we'd put the nets out on the the street and we'd play, play with a ball or whatever, and there'd be kids of all ages that would play, and I'd get to play with my brother and some of his friends. But one thing I always wanted was to have my brother on my team because he was a good hockey player and it seemed like whatever team he was on wouldn't always win, but they'd usually win. And it wasn't just that, but when I played road hockey with my brother and he was on my team, I knew that he was watching out for me. I knew that um, if there was a bully that was going to uh, push me around or give me a rough time or whatever, that he'd be there to watch out for me and protect me. And not only that, because my brother was a good hockey player, he'd be watching for me as we'd be running down the road or we'd be skating down the ice towards the net. And he just had that way of putting the puck or the ball on my stick just at the right time and setting me up and bang, I'd put it in the net. Like nobody else could. So you see, my brother was the kind of guy that when I was a kid, I wanted to have him on my side. And it actually bothered me sometimes when we played hockey if he was on the other team's side and I had to play against him. It used to, it used to really bother me because it, sometimes I'd be playing in the net and he'd be scoring goals on me. <laughs> and it wasn't a pleasant experience. <clears throat> but think about that for a minute. Think about who you'd like to have on your side or who you would like to have as a buddy or a person that's going to help you. If someone was to tell you that you could have the smartest, the richest, and the most powerful person in the world on your side, what would you say? If someone were to tell you that there was someone that's willing to die for you, that was going to be at your side, and that was going to help you and assist you, what would you think? As you're thinking about that, let's have a look at Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and 32. And these two verses say, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for this 
a tremendous series that we've been having in the book of Romans and all of the things that have been brought to our attention, all of the lovely truths that have been revealed to us. And Father, we would just trust and pray that as we look into your word this morning, these two little lovely verses, Father, that indeed they would be a blessing to us. We thank you that in the Lord Jesus Christ that we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And we just trust that as we look at this now, that we will be blessed by your word, that there are things here that will encourage us, that might correct us, that would build us up, and that would equip us to better serve you and make us more like your son, the Lord Jesus. And these things we ask and pray in his name. Amen. It's interesting the way this verse 31 starts off. It says, What then shall we say to these things? Now, Maybe you weren't here last week, or maybe you haven't been here for a few weeks, and you'd say, what's he talking about? What is he talking about when he says, what then shall we say to these things? What things is Paul talking about? Well, we've been climbing a mountain, so to speak, as we've been going through the book of Romans, and I've tried to depict that in our picture here on the screen. And we started off in the beginning of the book of Romans in what I'll call Death Valley. The Apostle Paul explains in those first two and a half chapters of the book of Romans that we are dead in trespasses and sins. Now that's a quote from Ephesians. But Paul explains that the whole world, both Gentile and Jew, are under the condemnation of God's law because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we saw, though, that as we ascend this mountain, so to speak, of truth in the first eight chapters of of the book of Romans. That the first thing that's revealed to us is that in the Lord Jesus Christ, us having put our faith in him, that we are justified, that we have the forgiveness of sins. And that you might picture as maybe one of the things that we learn as as we begin to ascend out of this position of separation from God in our sins. And we begin to ascend this mountain, so to speak, of what God has done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what's revealed to us in these first eight chapters of Romans. So we saw in verses, or rather chapters 3 through 5, where Paul talks about justification, the forgiveness of sins, and how that depends and rests upon the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in chapters 6 and 7, we learned that not only are our sins forgiven, but God has also made provision in Calvary's cross for us to be delivered from sin's power. We know that because we're part of Adam's race, that we are sinners by nature. And we often say that, you know, with those of us that have children, that we, we realize that you don't have to teach them how to sin. It's something that they do quite naturally. And we, as, as adults even, fall into sin quite na- naturally in our flesh, in our human nature. <clears throat> but we saw that the Lord Jesus Christ, that when he went to Calvary's cross, that he also purchased for us or won for us there a victory, that he delivered us from this power that sin naturally has over us, And that now, we are now enslaved to righteousness in him. And that we died to sin, it says in Romans chapter 6. But then we transition into Romans chapter 8, and it's interesting that that chapter talks about those that are children of God, or also sons of God, and heirs of God. And Brother Al spoke to us about this. And it talks about that those that are sons of God are spirit-led. And it's an interesting thing to think about, actually, that in a sense that the Spirit has led us up to the top of this mountain and revealed to us the wholeness of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us on Calvary's cross. And what we were looking at over the last couple of weeks was this third aspect of our salvation. The first one was justification, the forgiveness of sins. The second one is sanctification, deliverance from sin's power. And the third one... And crowning achievement, so to speak, of the Lord Jesus Christ's work on Calvary's cross is our glorification. And in this is revealed God's ultimate purpose for us. And we looked at this last week. You remember verse 28 said, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. And then the next verse explains what that purpose is. It says that for whom he foreknew he also predestined, or marked out before time, to be conformed to the image of his Son. And last week we looked at the two aspects of us being conformed to the image of Christ. One is to be conformed to his character. And verse 28 explains that every circumstance 
that takes place, that everything that happens in our life, that God is using that to conform us to the character of Christ. But the the day is going to come when we're going to meet him face to face and we are going to be changed in our bodies. These mortal bodies are going to be made immortal. These perishable bodies are going to be made imperishable. And many have commented how as we get towards the end of this uh, chapter 8 that really what we've done is we've ascended to the top of truth in terms of what God has done for us in the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a marvelous thing here, that as you think about ultimately what God's purpose is for you as a believer, that you're going to be like Jesus Christ. You're going to be conformed to his physical likeness and given an immortal body, and that you're also going to be conformed to his character. And we looked at that a little bit last week, how you will be perfected in his love and in his joy and in his peace and in his patience, etc., etc. All those characters that are described in Galatians chapter 5 as the fruit of the Spirit, that those things are going to be perfected in you. But there's a marvelous truth that's in the passage that we just looked at last week, that everything that happens to us, that every circumstance, every event that happens to us, that God is using that to accomplish that purpose. That indeed is an incredible truth. You know, and as I think about that, I sort of picture myself standing on top of this mountain, looking down and looking at and surveying how vast the work of the Lord Jesus Christ is and the magnitude of what he accomplished for me and for you at Calvary's cross. And how great God really is. How sovereign he is, in that everything that happens to us, and we don't see his hand in it necessarily, and there's times when we might not even believe that God has a hand in whatever it is that happens to us in our day-to-day lives, but every single thing that's happening to us, that God is using it to make us more like Jesus Christ, whether we can see it or not, whether we can see it or not. It's interesting that this passage declares that God is for us, so who can be against us? And there's a great truth here, that God always has our best interests in mind. Again, whether we may feel it or think it or not, that God has our best interests in mind. And that, as I said, he's using every circumstance to our personal benefit. You see, I asked the question before, if someone were to tell you that you had the smartest the richest and the most powerful person in the world on your side, what would you say? And that's very similar to what Paul has said here. He says, what then shall we say to these things? God is for us. You see, the fact is we do. If you're a believer and you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that this is a fact, that this is a great truth that's revealed to us in the Scriptures, that we do have the smartest, the richest, and the most powerful person on our side. In fact, it's probably more appropriate for me to say, in fact, we are on his side. That by us putting our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, what we have done is we have been uh, placed our trust in in God to carry out his plan of salvation on our part. We've joined his side, so to speak. God never changes. But we know the time came in our life when the Holy Spirit convicted us of our sins. And we decided, I want to have my sins forgiven. I want to be delivered from this awful pattern that's in my life where I sin and I sin and I sin and I sin. And I want to know that one day I'm going to go to a place to be with God. I'm going to see Him face to face and I want to be delivered from this sin-wracked world that we live in. And that by... Us putting our trust in Christ, we have, so to speak, joined sides with God. We have aligned ourselves by faith with his purpose. And now by faith we have availed ourselves of all of the benefits that we have in Jesus Christ and what it is that he has done at Calvary's cross. You see, he is the smartest person in the world. He knows all things. God is all-knowing. He is omniscient. He is the most powerful person in the world. And we might think of some other 
people in the world that are very powerful and have lots of influence in that, the Donald Trumps of the world and people like that, but they're nothing compared to God. God is the most powerful person, the most powerful being in all the universe. He made the universe. And he is the possessor of all things. He owns all things. And he is also the richest person on the world. As I said, he owns all things and he has power over all things. He is omniscient. He knows all things and he's omnipresent. He is everywhere and he's omnipotent. That means that he is all-powerful. If you've put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have that person on your side, so to speak. God is for you. And this is something that we need to keep in mind. Because there's many times that we might feel that perhaps God isn't for us. The scripture says at the end of verse 31, if God is for us, who can be against us? And we're going to look at that in a little more detail next week, Lord willing, when we look at verses 33 and 34. But you know, there may be times that we may feel that God is against us. There may be circumstances in your life, difficult challenges, physical trials, mental anguish, perhaps all of those things at the same time. And we may develop the sense that God is against me. Something's changed. And that God is now against me. But the scriptures say that that is not true. If I put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that God is always for us. And that he is always working through all those circumstances to suit our best interests. Not necessarily to give us what we want, but to accomplish his good purpose and to do those things which are best for us. <clears throat> you know, others may oppose us with evil intent. You may have people that you work with that at times are against you. And some of their motives may not be pure. They may be evil, as a matter of fact. Or if you go to school, there may be times when you've had to deal with bullies or people that ostracize you or reject you because of who you are and what you believe or whatever it might be. Indeed, you're going to come across people in this world that will oppose you and that will intend bad for you but God never does. God is not against you if you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he only has good intentions for you. He only has good intentions for you. You see, there may be others that will oppose us with evil intent, but the scriptures say, so to speak, so what? Who can overthrow God? If God is for us, this is the Almighty God. Who can change his purpose? Who can foil his plan? Who can stop him from accomplishing what it is that he's doing for me? That he's going to conform me to the likeness of his son, Jesus Christ. No one can thwart God's purpose and plan. Absolutely no one. Not even Satan himself. And it's a marvelous thing that if you look at what happened 2,000 years ago when Christ came to this earth as Israel's Messiah, the one that was promised that would rule over them and be their king, that Satan set out to spoil that. The most powerful angel of all, Satan himself, set out to try to foil God's plan. And what ultimately happened? He played right into it, didn't he? He played right into it. He set out to have Jesus Christ crucified. And he was the one that was behind uh, the religious leaders that wanted him dead and him being betrayed, etc., etc. Those are all things that Satan was working at behind the scenes to accomplish. God allowed it to happen. Why? Because he's sovereign, and because he's all-powerful, and it played right into his plan. Nobody can stop God when he sets out to accomplish something. And he has set out to accomplish his purpose in you, that you would be like Jesus Christ. And even although you may feel at times that God is against you and that things are going wrong. Something must be wrong. I don't feel very good about this. This is where our faith comes in. The Bible says God is for you and there's no one that can thwart his plan. No one that can stop him from accomplishing what it is that he seeks to accomplish in us. You see, God is such a great God that he can set this creation free, so to speak, to do its own will. And each of us have a free will that we can do what we want. 
But he is such a great and powerful and sovereign God that his will will be accomplished. In notwithstanding our free will that we choose what we do, we cannot overcome a great, all-powerful God. He has the power to cause all events that take place in our lives to benefit us. You believe it? That's what the Word of God teaches us. That God is for us. And that He is seeking to accomplish His good will and purpose in us. It says in verse 32 that God has spared no expense in purchasing this inheritance for us. And that's what we look forward to. Our inheritance, and we've been studying this in Romans chapter 8, is that we would be glorified with Christ. And you'll remember we were studying it how the whole creation is groaning and waiting for the revelation of the saints, the church, to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. That this will be a marvelous event. This is our inheritance, and the scriptures teach us that the Holy Spirit is a seal that guarantees that event. That we have that guarantee, the redemption of our bodies, it says in verse uh, 23. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. And verse 32 says that he who did not spare his own son, this is God the Father, did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? You see, God has spared no expense in purchasing this glorious position that we have in his family as heirs. And he has given us the benefits of being heirs within his family absolutely freely. It's come wholly at his expense. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 13. As I was looking at this, it reminds me of this uh, lovely little parable that's in Matthew chapter 13. There's a series of them here. Some of them are a bit tricky and some of them are, are easy to misunderstand or misapply. But we'll look at one fairly well-known one here in, in Matthew chapter 13 and verses 45 and 46. <clears throat> the Lord Jesus Christ it says to his disciples, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. It's really a beautiful thing, the, the picture of how even a pearl is made within an oyster, how it's necessary in, uh, for that pearl in order to be formed for the mantle, the interior of that oyster to be pierced by a grain of sand or something foreign in order that the pearl can be formed. And this is a beautiful picture of the church. You see that God spared no expense in purchasing the church as his own possession. We read in verse 32 that he who did not spare his own son, this is in Romans 8, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And verse 46 of Matthew 13 says that who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? He gave the most precious possession that he had in that sense. His own son, the second person of the Godhead, came into this world and he purchased us with the death and resurrection of his own son. That's why we call him my Redeemer, because he has purchased me. And so this scripture explains to us that there really is someone for us that was willing to die for us. I asked that question at the beginning. How would you feel if you knew that there was somebody that's willing to die for you, was on your side. Well, God is for you. And he was willing to die for you. God, the second person of the Godhead, came into this world. And he died a horrible death in order that 
the Father's purpose might be accomplished in you and that you might receive this glorious inheritance of being completely delivered from sin and all of its effects and consequences, including death, and being delivered from this present creation, which groans with the effects of sin and the pain and the suffering and all of that that all comes as sort of part and parcel with the mess, so to speak, that Adam created when he sinned, that we're going to be delivered from that into a glorious new creation where there's no sin and there's no consequences of sin whatsoever. That that was purchased at Calvary's cross. Now, if God would give his only son in order to purchase that for you, it says in verse 32, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? I believe that these are words of encouragement to us because there's times in our life when we will wonder, I certainly have, does God really know what he's doing? This is a terrible mess that I'm in. It might be in your your family. It might be something that's gone wrong in in your relationship with your spouse. It might be a problem that you have at work. It might be at school and you wonder, what good can possibly come out of this? And you know what? What? There are times when you will not be able to see any good in it whatsoever. We will not be able to see, especially right in the middle of it, what possible good could come out of the circumstance that we're in. But the scriptures say that all things work together for good and that God is for us. There's times when we might look to God and say, you know, why are you allowing this to happen to me? And what good could this possibly do me? There are times you're going to feel like that. There are times I have, I know. But we should be assured that there is one that is willing to die for us and that has given the most precious, valuable part of his own being, his own son for us. If he has done that, surely he will meet our needs day to day and that he will use those things that happen to us for our own benefit, even if we don't understand what it is that's going on. You see that there's someone that freely gives us everything that we truly need. Last week when we looked at earlier in this passage where it talks about how the Spirit intercedes for us with uh, groanings which cannot be uttered or understood, that we said that God's Spirit searches our hearts and minds and He knows what our needs are and He communicates them to God. He knows what those needs are even better than we do ourselves. We need to be willing to admit that at times when we're in the middle of messy situations in our lives and we're troubled and we think we know what we need and we approach God and we ask Him to do this and to change that circumstance and whatever it may be. That ultimately we're willing to humble ourselves and say, God, but not my will. I might think I know what I need in this situation. But you know better. You know what's best for me. You know how you're using this circumstance to accomplish your purpose. And that we trust that even if we cannot see the good in it, we trust that there is good in it because God's word says that there is. Ephesians 1 and 3 says that God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Everything. Everything that is needful for us, we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about physical things. I'm not talking about the Corvette Stingray that you might think you want and need. Or the bigger house that you think you need and you want. Or that position at work, whatever it might be, I'm not talking about those things. Those are things that you might think you want and you need. But God knows. Maybe He is going to give you a new car. Maybe you will get a promotion at work. But the question is, do you trust that whatever circumstances God leads you through in your life, that He's using each and every one of them to accomplish His purpose? And as we said last week, it's all good. Are you willing to count it as all good? That's the work of the Spirit in and of itself. One of the characters of Christ is his meekness. He never argued with the Father when he was here on on earth. He petitioned him, but then he said, but not my will, but your will. And he was willing to accept 
God's plan for him without arguing and resisting. And we see many other examples in the scriptures. You remember when we studied the story of Jonah, how Jonah was the opposite of that, wasn't he? Where God said, I want you to go here. And he wouldn't. He went the other way. And then finally, when Jonah did go to Nineveh and preached the word that God had given him, Jonah had his own agenda, his own expectations and what he wanted God to do. And when God didn't do it, he argued with God. See, God was teaching him meekness. And he's teaching us the same thing. To subject ourselves to him and to accept whatever circumstances it is that God brings into our lives, that we will count it as all good because we trust, we have faith that he's using it to accomplish his purpose. In the time that we have uh, remaining, I'd like to look at two examples in the scriptures of God's good intention and how those that were experiencing God's plan and being called to experience the benefits of God's plan might not have thought that they were in a very good position. But God reassured them that indeed they were. First of all, let's go to uh, the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament. Jeremiah chapter 29. There's a verse in this passage that I remember when I had a real turnaround in my life when I was 27 years old. I'd been living a life of uh, rebellion up until that point. And I can remember when I saw this verse in Jeremiah 29, how it reassured me that God really had a plan for me and that he wasn't against me. And if I would just put my trust in him, and allow him to truly be the Lord of my life and to trust in what Christ had done for me at Calvary's cross to cleanse me and release me from all guilt of my sins. That indeed, that if, I, that if I trusted God, that he had good plans for me and that my life was going to be ultimately a lot better than it was without him. Many of us fear. Much of the word, world fears Jesus Christ and fears God because they fear that if they put their trust in him, and give them their life, so to speak, that things won't be better. They fear that. They fear religion. That religion is going to take over my life and it's just going to be a bunch of do's and don'ts. Now, some religions are like that. But Christianity isn't. Not biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity has set us free from the do's and don'ts, hasn't it? We were once under the do's and don'ts. We were once under God's law. And that's what we've been studying in the book of Romans, how Christ has set us free from that. And we now enjoy this glorious liberty that we have as children of God being ruled by his spirit, the indwelling spirit. And when we abide in the Lord Jesus Christ and trust in him day to day, that his life works in us to bear his fruit, his love, his joy, his peace, his patience. And the scripture says against those things, there are no do's and don'ts. Right? That's my paraphrase. There is, against such things, there is no law. We're no longer under law. We don't use that liberty to indulge the sinful nature. Why? Romans 6, we studied this, says we died to sin. We've been given victory over it and power over sin uh, as a principle in our lives. Now, in Jeremiah chapter 29, we know that the nation of Israel had entered into a covenant with God. This is what's called the Old Covenant. It was a covenant of law, the Mosaic Law. And they agreed that they would obey God and keep his commandments and that he would be their only God and they wouldn't worship any other gods before him. Of course, we know that they broke that covenant. God held up his end of the covenant. But Israel couldn't. Why? Because they were part of Adam's race, because they had a sinful nature. And God had warned them that if they broke the covenant and that if they turned and worshipped other gods, that a great curse would come upon them, that their enemies would conquer them. And that's exactly what happened. We know that the Assyrians conquered the northern part of Israel, and one generation later, that the southern kingdom, it's known as Judah, was conquered by the Babylonians, and they were carried off into exile. 
for 70 years. And that time of exile was not a very pleasant time for them. You can imagine when your enemies are ruling over you that it might be a time when it wouldn't be sort of uh, that enjoyable as far as uh, you being able to do what you want to do excuse me, in pursuing your own happiness. But look at what this passage says in Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 10 through 14. The Lord spoke to them through the prophet Jeremiah and said, After 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts, or if you have an NIV, it says plans. I know the plans that I have towards you, says the Lord. Plans of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I cause you to be carried away captive. And in Jeremiah 30 and verse 3, says, For behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will bring back from captivity my people Israel and Judah, says the Lord, and I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. You see, God had a plan for Israel. He had promised to them under the first covenant that the land known as Canaan, the promised land, was theirs, and it would be an eternal possession for them. them. That seemed to have disappeared because of their disobedience. But God said, trust me. Trust me. Align yourself with my plan and my purpose. You've been going your own way because you think your way is better than my way. You think you'll be happier if you do it your way than if you do it my way. But trust me. Trust me. I've got a plan. I've got a purpose for you. And that plan, what does it say? I've got it up here on the screen. I believe this is fairly close to the NIV translation, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You see, Israel had come under God's discipline and under his chastisement. But had had he completely cast them away? And we'll actually be looking at this as we get into Romans 9 and 10 and 11. No. They had come under his discipline, but he still had a plan for them. And he was going to bring them out of the place where they were held captive. And he was going to honor his promise to them that they would have the land that he had promised to them. You see, they had an inheritance, Israel. It's an earthly inheritance that the land that he had promised to them would be theirs. And he was going to do it for them. He said, I've got good plans for you. I've got plans to prosper you. And you see, Israel was promised earthly prosperity. And he said, I've got those plans for you. And and my intent is not to harm you. Oh, you've come under my discipline because of your sin. But I have plans not to harm you. I have plans to give you a hope and your future is bright. The question is, do you trust me? Do you trust me? Will you align yourself by faith with that purpose and that plan that I have? You see what he says, for you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. God had plans for Israel. He still has plans for Israel. They're good plans. It's going to be a marvelous thing for us to witness as the church God reveal his plan for Israel to the whole world. We know that when Jesus Christ comes back to reign on this earth for a thousand years, that he will deliver Israel from destruction when their enemies will have gathered around them, empowered by Satan himself. And he will deliver them from that destruction and they will become the greatest nation in the earth and reign with Christ for a thousand years. He's got plans for them. He's got plans for them. And there is a remnant that by faith will avail themselves of that plan and reign with him when he comes back to this earth. Now, where Israel has an earthly inheritance, the church has a heavenly one. Sometimes we get a little bit confused when we look at passages like this because we see there are similarities that God deals with his creation consistently. And there are principles that are consistent in the way that he has dealt with Israel and the way that he deals with us, the church. Are his plans identical? Not completely identical. There are those that sometimes have looked at this and have said, well, that must mean that earthly prosperity is mine as well. And that's not the case. 
if you study the scriptures, you'll see that there's nowhere that we are promised as the church that we have an earthly inheritance. We have a heavenly one. That our inheritance is that one day we are going to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. We are going to be conformed to his likeness. Could it be any better than that? Would you trade silver and gold? Would you trade a big house for being completely delivered from sin and all of its effects and being made like the Lord Jesus Christ in character and having an immortal body like his? You see, Israel at the time when they were in captivity, they might have thought that God had abandoned them and that God's plan no longer was there and that he didn't have good thoughts towards them and that there was no benefit in trusting in God anymore. But his purpose for them had not changed. And you see, it's similar for us as well, that we need to keep our eye on that heavenly inheritance that we have, that purpose that God has for us. And there are going to be times when it may seem like God perhaps has turned against us, when difficult circumstances are coming into our life. And we might wonder whether, does God really have a plan to prosper me? Is he really still on my side? Or has something gone wrong? And I believe that it's very similar for us to what it is here with Israel. Again, not that we would look for an earthly inheritance, an earthly prosperity, but that we would continue to fix our eyes on the heavenly things, the unseen things that we have in Jesus Christ, and that we would trust that indeed God has a plan and a purpose for us as well. Now, one other thing then before we finish Um, If you could turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Now, most of us, I trust, knew our earthly fathers. Maybe some some didn't. Um, And that does happen sometimes. But most of us, I trust, remember our fathers. I trust that most of us had fathers that had good intentions for us. Now, there are some that don't, and I acknowledge that. And you may even have had one of those fathers. And so what we're about to look at here very briefly may be difficult for you to relate to. But most of us had a father, had parents that had good intentions for us. They wanted to see us grow up and be successful to know right from wrong, to get a good education, and to become uh, a successful person, so to speak, in the world that we live in. And they used whatever methods they had, good or bad, and imperfect as they were, to try to achieve that good intention through training us. And I'm sure if you think back, and I certainly can, and I can say I'm thankful that I had a father like that. Oh, he's not perfect. Nobody is. And there were times when I could see those imperfections and it irked me. And there were other times when my father applied discipline when I was out of line, in particular when I was a rebellious teenager, but also when I was a young boy as well and rebelling. And there were times that I'm sure if you had said that my father was doing me good, I would have laughed at you. And I said, that's crazy. He's just making life rough for me. And that his intent towards me was just to be mean. That was the way that I would have saw it. I'm sure when you were a child or maybe a teen, And maybe some of the teens that are here today, even sometimes when you come under your parents' discipline, you wonder, what on earth are they doing? They're just being mean-spirited. They're just trying to make life rough on me. They're trying to make life, they're trying to take away all my fun, right? And it can seem that way sometimes with God, too, right? It says in verse um, 9 of Hebrews 12, Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? If we endured for a time discipline under our fathers when we were in that home, imperfect as they were, trusting, at least part of the time, that they had our best intentions in mind, and and, and as parents, we often reassure our kids, and I'm doing this for your own good. And they go, oh yeah, 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 here we go, I'm going to hear this again, sort of thing, right? But we trusted that to a measure with our imperfect earthly fathers. How much more will we trust our Heavenly Father, who is not imperfect, who knows all things, who has all resources at His command, how much more will we trust Him? It says in verse 10, For they indeed for a few days chastened us, this, these are our earthly fathers, as they seemed, as seemed best to them, 
but he, our Heavenly Father, for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. That's part of his purpose as well, isn't it? That we are partakers of the divine nature. We have received the Holy Spirit and we are going to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. We are partakers of his holiness. It says in verse 11, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. As we think of our earthly fathers and their good intentions for us, even if their methods were imperfect, we can think all the more of our Heavenly Father who will lead us through various circumstances that are training us. We don't like the word chastise in our culture. It sounds a lot like a beating, doesn't it? Even the word discipline sometimes will cause our teeth to to uh, degrade a little bit. But what God is doing is he's training us up into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And the word guarantees us, God's word guarantees us that that training, that discipline, there's going to be times when it's not pleasant. Just as it wasn't when your parents, when your father was training you as a child in his home. There were times that it wasn't very pleasant. But the scriptures guarantee us that although it is not pleasant at the time, and even painful, that later on it produces a harvest of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. It's interesting that the Word of God says that Christ is the first fruits. He is the first fruits. He is the first to have this state of perfection. A body that's immortal and a person that dwells in sinless perfection. He's the very, very first. But the scripture says that there's a harvest that's coming. And we're going to be part of that harvest. That God is using every circumstance that we're going through now to train us up and point us to the point when in that sense that that righteousness will be harvested. When it'll all come to an end. When I will be conformed to the likeness of Christ, both in character and in my physical nature. And friends, I just want to encourage you that as we go through some of the trials and tribulations and challenges that we face in this life, that the Word of God tells us that it's all good. It doesn't mean that it's all pleasant. It doesn't mean that you necessarily have to enjoy it. But the Word of God says that we should trust and have faith that God is for us, that nobody can thwart His plan. If He gave His only Son for us, how much more will He use all of the things that happen to us in in our day-to-day lives for our good. Can we close with a, with a hymn? There's uh, one in number, in the red hymn book, number 584.